Flying, a good friend, Vietnam veteran, veteran of the 173rd Airborne, who was a sky jumper, and we're going to hear his story. I'm Larry Woods with the Veterans Breakfast Club History Project, and we're trying to get this story done for posterity. So let's start, Bob, with uh, telling us a little bit about how you entered the military, when you entered, and how you ended up uh, going into the Army. Well, I, I finished high school. I was 17 years old. Well, back then, there weren't many jobs for 17-year-olds. So uh, I mainly goofed off for uh, my time between 17 and 18. Well, 18 rolled around and I still couldn't find a job, so I ended up in the Army, uh, August of, eight, August of uh, 1965. I went in into the Army. Uh, I went in in, in downtown Pittsburgh and uh, took a, ended up taking a train from downtown Pittsburgh to Fort Knox, Kentucky. At Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, I, I spent uh, a couple months there doing my basic training. And uh, after basic training, I was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for my advanced uh, individual training, which was uh, infantry. Did you have a choice? Uh, well, I, I probably did, but uh, I, I just didn't know it. I was, <laughs> I was, I was a kid. What did I know? Um, I, I, I did my AIT at, at Fort Jackson. After Fort Jackson, I went to Fort Benning for jump school. Now, did you volunteer for jump school? I volunteered for jump school. I wanted to jump. Um, that that was that was January of '66. Um, I graduated from jump school on January 27th, 1966. Uh, by after jumping twice on on one day. Uh, and the reason we jumped twice on one day is because we had missed the day before due to high winds. Um, so what's it like jumping out of a perfectly good airplane? Oh, well, yeah, sometimes it can be good, sometimes it can be bad. <laughs> uh, I've had good experiences. And I've had some bad ones. I've, I've gone through people's suspension lines. Um, I've, I've had some pretty hard landings. Um, but I've had good ones and I've had bad ones. So you survived jump school. So where did they send you for your first uh, permanent duty station? I, after, after jump school, I was sent straight to... Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and I was assigned to Bravo Company, 2nd Battalion, 501st Infantry, which was the first airborne unit in the Army. Um, it, 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 its uh, symbol is Geronimo. Did you actually yell Geronimo when you jumped out no, of the plane? No. <laughs> I didn't think so. So what did you do, or how long were you at uh, Fort Jackson then? Fort Jackson? Oh, or you're Fort, Fort Campbell. Fort Campbell. Fort Campbell. Um, I was at Fort Campbell from May of, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, January of 66 to May of 67. And then did you get your orders for Vietnam? That's when I got my orders for, for Vietnam. Were you assigned to the 173rd at that point, or did that come later? I, I was tentatively scheduled to go to the 101st in Vietnam. But when I showed up in Vietnam, the, the 173rd had a unit that lost 76 people in one day. 
and they needed 76 people. So I was snatched from the replacement detachment and sent to the 173rd as a replacement for one of those 76. This unit had a nickname, No Deros Alpha. Deros, as you know, means date of expected return from overseas. Right. Well, no Deros means that you aren't coming home. They give you a lot of confidence sometimes. Yeah, they, they do give you a lot of confidence. <laughs> yeah. So you end up, where, where in Vietnam did you land? I know the 173rd came in originally. Well, I came in. On, but where did you go in? I came in at Tonsonu. Tonsonu. And, and um, I, I initially went to the 173rd base at Benoit, but then they, they after their jungle school, they, they uh, at, at Benoit they sent me to Doc To, which uh, is not a very good place. Yeah, for the frame of reference for anybody that doesn't know, Doc well, Doc to in is, Doc to is, is near the junction of the Viet, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodian borders. Right. So it's kind of north and west. Yeah, it's in the central highlands. Right. And it's a big, uh, there's a large hill there. No, yeah, there's, there's a lot of large hills there. And uh, it's, it's like in the middle of nowhere. And uh, there are very few Vietnamese there. Uh, it, 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 there are mostly uh, what we used to call mountain yards. Mountain yards, yeah. Or, or yards. Um, it's, it's not a very nice place. Were you surprised to find that Vietnam had so many uh, indigenous people that were not Vietnamese but had their own cultures that were living there? No, I was, was that I a surprise. Was, I was pretty much open to okay. anything. I mean, I, I wasn't surprised by much. Uh, okay. Mm. So when you got to Doc To, what uh, what was your first order of business? Try to figure out how to stay alive because. Uh, the, the unit I was assigned to seemed to lose a lot of people. Um, now you were originally going, uh, the Battle of Docto itself has a defined kind of time frame when the major battle occurred. The major battle occurred on 22 June 67, which was the 76 people right. that, that I was a replacement, I want uh, a replacement. Okay. Four. So you were actually, when you got there, the battle had uh, was already on, had ongoing, already yeah. and you're still, you're still engaged though. Oh no, they, that that was a, that was a one day battle. Okay. And did, uh, when you got there, were the uh, NVA gone, scattered, or were you, just, or were you still trying? I mean, they to... were probably still there. It's just, just that, that we weren't in, in, engaged. You weren't engaged yet. So what did you guys do at that point? We went back out there in the same place at the same, doing the same thing that they were doing when they got overrun. So tell me about the the, uh, the engagement you were in. Well, that I, I was in A Company for three months, and um, I started off initially with a machine gun, uh, M60 machine gun. Mm -hmm. uh, An M60 machine gun weighed 25 pounds, right. and I didn't like walking around the jungle all day long with that thing in my arms. It was heavy. So I complained about it, and I said, hey, get me off of this thing. Give me something else. And then finally, one day, they said, you want off of the machine gun? I said, yeah. So they said, put the machine gun down. They, I, put, I put it down, and they said, there you are. There's your new... You know, weapon? But it wasn't a weapon. It was a, it was a radio. <laughs> it was an ANPRC 25 radio. Now, the Prick 25 weighs 25 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Good swap. It weighs, it weighs the same as, as, the, as, as the, the machine M60. gun, except you can put it on your back. You can hook it to your rucksack. And it also makes you a target because it's got the big antenna. 
but it doesn't make the noise that the machine gun does. It doesn't draw fire, in, unless they can see it. And then it draws a lot of fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, fun. So, how long were you at Docto before you had your major engagement? Well, uh, I, I became, became a platoon radio in A Company. And then on September 1st, 1967, they made D, D, D Company or Delta Companies. Uh, one day, uh, one of the NCOs walked up to me and said, Hey, Fleming, get your stuff together. You're going to D Company. And I said, There isn't any D Company. And he said, Yes, sir, as soon as you get there. And I said, Are you, are you kidding me? Or is this for real? He said, This is for real. I got my stuff together and I was gone. I left. And uh, when I got to Delta Company, I became a, the company commander's battalion command that radio man. And uh, that, was, that was September 1st. Well, September 1st, we, we still were at the October. October, we went to Tuiwa. The, we got on planes and we flew up to Tuiwa and we helped the 101st Airborne um, protect the rice crop um, harvest at Tuiwa. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of October, uh, the rumor mill told us we were going back to Docto, and of course the rumor mill was correct. So, and no one was happy, no one. Um, a lot of irate paratroopers uh, for that one. And uh, anyway, they put us on planes, they flew us back to Docto, and next thing you know, we're back out in the jungle. And uh, every day was worse than the day before. We started taking casualties in the battalion, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And then around, uh, I don't know what, what day it was, we, we were at Fire Support Base 16. Bravo Company had just left the, the perimeter not long before. Bravo Company went out, and next thing you know, we, we could hear from a distance uh, a lot of heavy automatic weapons fire. Um, Bravo Company got chewed up quite a, you know, quite a bit. Uh, they, they sent us out to help, but by the time we got there it was all over. And we helped clean up the scene. And uh, they sent Bravo Company back to Fire Support Base 16 and just Alpha, Charlie, and Delta continued on. And we continued on, and I'm thinking that was that was late in the month. I, I know the date. That's okay. But uh, I'm not quite sure right now. Now, did you were you guys going out to engage, or were you just being attacked? We were going out to engage. Okay, uh, so it was it was was. Uh, more or less a search and destroy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, okay. Anyway, we're we're moving through the jungle. We were moving through the jungle, and uh, on November eighteenth, we encountered a large North Vietnamese Army base camp, and uh, we we. This was a big one, and we started moving through the base camp. And there were still fires in their fire pits, and we're going, oh my, the, these guys are still here somewhere. They're close, real close. And we were moving down, down the hill through their base camp. They had 
They had steps cut in the hill. They had banisters on the steps. And we're going, oh my, you know, these guys are here. You know, you don't do all this stuff unless, you know, you're here. Unless, this is kind unless of you're here place. to stay. Yeah. So we're going down through the hill. Anyway, on, on my radio, I hear Alpha Charlie Delta, this is three Yankee over. Anyway, I waited my turn to, to right. answer. You know, Alpha answered, and Charlie answered, and I answered. And they, they said, three, three, three Yankee over. They said, put your six on, which means put your company commander on. And I, I handed the... The speaking radio. Radio, yeah. to, handset to my company commander. And I said an expletive, and all my, all my co-workers turned and looked at me, and they said, "What's wrong? What's wrong?" And I says, "Oh, I says, I said we're going to Hill 875." They said, "What's that?" And I, and now I've been listening to this yeah. for for several days. Uh, special forces had been over there, and and trying to go up the hill. And I'd been listening to this and they weren't doing well. And uh, I, I, I'm thinking, oh my, we're gonna get drug into this. We're gonna get drug into this. And uh, it wasn't that far away. You know, a few clicks. And I'm thinking, oh my, we're gonna get, we're gonna get it. So my company commander's talking on the radio and they were going, all, all my coworkers were going, what's, what's wrong, what's wrong? They were going, oh, oh. So anyway, when he got done, he, he, he says to the first sergeant, okay, turn them turn around, we're going back, going back to the top of the hill we just came from, where we, where, where we were loggered the night before. So we turn around and back up this hill. I was right. We're going eight. He told him, we're going 875. I said, see, told you. <laughs> see, see, that's the nice thing about being a, uh, an RTO. That's, yeah. a, that's you, a, the, the you blessing know, and the curse. Huh? The blessing and the curse. Oh, yeah. yeah you know what's going on before, before everybody else does. Right. So I knew what was, I knew what was, it was going to happen before he did. And uh, we got all the way to the top of this hill. Then they shot, shot themselves. They were at the top of the hill. They were looking at their maps. They sh shot a couple of azimuths and they found a ridge that was running directly to the bottom of the north end of 875. Perfect. I mean, it was perfect. It was right on. Right. Hit the, hit the north end perfectly. So we're, we start down this, we start down this ridge. And as we're going down, the, down this ridge, through the trees, I, I see NVA running, running through the opening. You know, I, now, now they're a mile or so away, but I could see them with the pith helmets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I go, NVA, NVA, and, and, and by the time they all turn and look, they're gone, you know, yeah. you know, of course, I'm... Yeah, you're seeing ghosts. Yeah. So, but, but anyway, so we continue on. We get down to the bottom of the north end, and uh, there's a stream at the bottom, and as we go through the stream, everybody's filling their canteens because... You know, you always want to try to keep your canteens as full as possible. Sure. You know, because you never know when your next opportunity is going to be. Yeah, you're especially, not going to go to the 7-Eleven for a no, bottle of no, water. No, especially when you're going up a mountain. And who, who knows when you're going to right. have an opportunity. So we filled our canteens, and at the, at the base of 875 was a small, almost perfectly round knob, and uh, 
all three companies, we were the lead company, all three companies managed to pick, pick out a sector on this knob and set themselves up. And uh, we decided to logger on this hill for the night and every, we dug in, cleaned our weapons, uh, cut overhead cover, did everything we were supposed to do and they never bothered us. Never bothered us. Now there's, there's a regiment plus on this hill. We're, we're three understrength companies. There were 330 of us counting the chaplain. And we even had the chaplain with us, Father Waters. Anyway, we spent the night on this hill totally unmolested. They never bothered us one bit. And they could have. They never mortared us. They never did anything. Um, and they could have. They had us, I know they had that thing uh, registered, uh, that hill, that, that little hill. Mm -hmm. They could have dropped mortars on us, but they didn't. They just let us spend the night. It was a beautiful night. We, we were sitting there all awake, but they never, never bothered us at all. We woke up in the morning. We got ready to go up the hill. Father Waters had a mass. Uh, Father Father Waters had been humping with our company, with D Company. He 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 liked uh, First Sergeant Deeb. First Sergeant Deeb was a 35-year-old First Sergeant. He, he was a really really nice guy. Uh, he he could go along great with Father Father Waters. He so he was all he was with us a lot. Uh, so he had his he had his mass in our CP, mm -hmm. and and I was sitting monitoring the radios uh, right next to where he was having the the mass, and one of our guys. Um, came and sat, sat down next to me and uh, now I wasn't his best buddy. His best buddy was another guy, which was strange. Why didn't, why didn't he talk to his best buddy? Why did he want to talk to me? He says, he said, I screwed up. And I said, what are you talking about? And he says, he says, uh, I, think, I think what he did was he looked around and he said, who's going to survive this? And I, and, and, and I think he looked at me and he thought, he's going to survive this. Because he, we knew what we were going into. We knew they were up there. We knew there were a lot of them up there. And I think he looked at me and thought I was going to survive it, which I didn't think I was, had any better chance than anybody else. And I think he looked at me and thought I was going to survive this. And uh, he said, I, I, I screwed up. And I said, what are you talking about? And he says, I cheated on my wife and she left me. And he says, and he says, and he says, and when I get home, he says, I want to make things up and, and get back with her. And, and he says, I got two kids. He says, I got to get back with my wife. And he says, uh, I think he had to get it out of his system. Sure. And he, and he told me this. And uh, I tried to convey this to, to a member of his family. And it, it just didn't work. I don't know. But uh, strange things happen that day. Really strange things. It, it, he told me this stuff and and later on he went up the hill and got killed. And he and he did it like he meant to do it. Uh, but anyway, uh, he was one of the first guys killed up there. 
and he did it trying to save somebody. Any, anyway, we, we all got ready, and then I guess it was around close to around 10 o'clock or so, we finally, after the, all the air support, the, the, the air, the, the, the pre, uh, what's that called? The pre... Yes, the, the, the bombardment ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. The, they try to clear as much as they can yeah. before, the, before anyway, you move forward. Around 10 o'clock, we finally started up the hill. It was We were on the in the front on the left side. Charlie Company was on the right side, even with us. And Alpha Company was on both sides behind behind us. And and the, and the way it was going to work was if when we made contact, Delta Company was going to go right. Charlie Company was going to go left and close, and in the rear, Alpha Company was going to close the, the rear. And uh, we went up the hill. Uh, the hill was like this. It was a steep part, and then it then it kind of leveled off some. Well, we went up the steep part, and then we, we were right to here when they opened fire. And um, the first guy to get the first guy to get take take rounds was a guy by the name of Jacobson. Um, I think he was from Washington State somewhere, and uh, they killed him. He, he was in the point squad, and the point squad was Sergeant Shipman, Louis Zuko, Buzz Cox, um, a couple, I think, I think, uh, Sergeant Martin Sanchez. Anyway, anyway, uh, they they pinned those guys down. Now, the the company commander, and myself, and and my partner, uh, John Barry, the other radio man, uh, the first sergeant, we we were behind the lead platoon. It was the the, the, the point squad, <clears throat> then the lead platoon, where well, we were always behind the lead platoon. So we immediately went up to where the point squad was. And uh, I, I, was, I was with the company commander in front of this first bunker that, that the point squad had come to and uh, we were there for quite a while. Now the, the point squad had fought their way back down a little bit because they were in NVA bunkers and they had they had been um, engaged in a little bit of hand to hand fighting beating the NVA over the head with rifles. Um, and they got back to to in front of this first bunker. And that's and that's where we ended up. And uh, they were they were shooting rockets at us and throwing grenades and I I was laying on a mound of dirt and there was a log there. And they they were shooting rockets at us, and a, a rocket shot past me, and it it felt like somebody took a cold spoon and, and put it against my back hmm. in the middle. Now, 
you know nobody's putting cold spoons against your back. Right. You know. So so I I I I, I like shiver at first. And then a second or two after I shivered, I, I felt this burning in, we'll call, we'll call it my left buttock. Uh, and I turned around to look. Now I'm laying on the ground. And um, I had a column of blood come straight up from my butt, and it must have come come up this high from my butt. It must have come up this high, straight up, and you know it was like a column of nickels, straight up this high, and then it flopped over and come down and cover me with blood. And by that time, I definitely knew I was hit. And uh, at first, oh, but before that, I said, hey, I think I'm hit. And, and before I got the words hit out of my mouth, you know, that column of blood had come up. And I knew I was hit. And my, now my, my, now my, my FO, forward observer for D Company, mm -hmm. was laying here beside me. His name was Sergeant Randall Tenney, T-E-N-N-E-Y. Now, <laughs> Randy Tenney, he was a big guy. He was strong as an ox. He says to me, give me your knife. He, he said, give me your knife. I felt like a dumbass, I gave him my knife. I had, you know, like a K-bar mm -hmm. on, on right. my belt. I gave him my knife. I'm thinking he's just going to cut my pants. He takes it through the top of my pants, through my web belt, through my pants, all the way down to my ankle. He cut the whole, whole thing all the way down to the bottom. And the K-bars are not super sharp. Not necessarily, no. It My, takes some strength. That's what I said. He was, he was a big boy. Yeah. He was, he was, he was, he was probably six two, and and he and he was all muscle. He was all muscle. He 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 could pick me up and throw me, all the way across that room. I'm he we, he was he was big. So I start yelling, yelling at him and calling him every <laughs> foul name I could think of and, and, and questioning his mental capacity and, and stuff that you couldn't put on this. <laughs> and uh, Meanwhile, he's trying to save your life. Well, I mean, that's what he wanted to do, but, I mean, he, I, I, I says, well, what am I going to do now? I, you know, we were tanned from the waist stuff, right. from filling sandbags. You know, we were nice and tanned. But from the waist down, I was Casper the Friendly Ghost, <laughs> you know. And especially, you know, especially English background. Yep. You know, or pasty as can be in the first place. And... Uh, he he now made me white as a sheet, and and the pants and my trousers were useless. I couldn't put these things back on. I, I'd have, I'd have been tripping over them. So now here I all I have is because we we didn't wear underwear in the jungle, right. because you'd get golded. Now all I have on is a shirt and a pair of boots. And the prick fit and the prick twenty five. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> my equipment. Yeah. That's all I had. I did. I, I, I. Nothing to cover me. Did he get a compress on the? Uh... Didn't matter. The the piece of shrapnel that was in me. 
continued to burn. Ooh. It was so hot, luckily, it cauterized the wound. I stopped bleeding. It is lucky, because if it was shooting straight up, that means you hit an artery. Well, I don't and know you about would've, that. And you would, you know, well, well, I don't know what it hit. It would probably well, be I don't know exactly what it hit, but it, but it cauterized the wound. Wow. And it, I, I, I never bled another drop after that. Never, not another drop. No more bleed. So, anyway, needless to say, that made me unhappy. Because it exposed me. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that scared me to half to death. Because I was the whitest thing in that jungle. I, I mean, it was like a white flag. Uh, I mean... So... Here I was with, with nothing but a radio, an M16, a shirt, and a pair of boots. So when we, they yelled to fall back at, at one point after this. And I, everybody else fell straight back. I zigzagged. I zigzagged from tree to tree. Because I, I didn't know if they could see me or not. I didn't know if they, if they were, they were probably falling down laughing. You know, I, well, at least I hoped they were, <laughs> you know. Anyway, the, we, we ended up falling back to this hu humongous tree. This thing was, oh, this, that, that tree would, would have been hard, pre be hard pressed to fit in this living room. It, it was huge. It was huge. And uh, that's where we set up our new CP. And most of the, all of the wounded, uh, Charlie Company's command group and Delta Company's command group, uh, the wounded, the medics that were still around, uh, were all at this. We're all at this CP, and uh, we we were. That's where we operated, and uh, that's where we were when the 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 Marines showed up, the Marine airplanes, and uh, I wasn't on my radio when that happened. Uh, one, of, one of the guys in the headquarters section was digging a hole and he was huffing and puffing and he was having a difficult time of it and uh, I, I went over to him and I says go get on the he was qualified to handle the radios. Mm -hmm. And, and I told him, go get on my radio, I'll dig the hole. And uh, he got on my radio, and I started digging. And Father Waters came back from running around the hill all day. It was the first time he had sat down for the whole day. Now this this had to be. This was after. Well, this had to be after seven o'clock. And and we had been on the go, on this hill since ten, around ten o'clock. So it was that eight hours. About eight hours, yeah. About eight hours. It's the first time he he had he had sat down. He had been patching up people and doing all his all the stuff in that citation since 10 o'clock. And this was the first time he had sat down. And he, he says, hey, Bob, th throw me my rucksack. Now, his rucksack was right next to me. And 
and I knew which one it was because he had the, the lightest rucksack in the, in the uh, CP. And I, I knew which one it was, and I picked it up, and I said, here you go, Father, and I pitched him his rucksack. And he sat down, and he pulled out some sea rations, and he started to eat sea rats. And, uh, and then, then an A-1 Sky Raider flew north to south, um, up, up the side of the hill. He got up towards the top of the hill, and he turned west, and then he turned back north. And then I lost him in the in the trees. Now the now the trees weren't completely denuded from vegetation like they they uh, would be, you know, by the end of the battle. Sure. But uh, so I so I lost them. And so I went back to digging. And I wasn't digging too long. sitting there and all of a sudden I heard a loud bang and I when I heard the loud bang I picked up my head and there was a flame front coming at me that covered the whole sky and this is and, and it the flame front come at me, like the, and, and, it, and it was right there. And it, the flame front came at me like this. And next thing you know, it, it, it just enveloped my whole body. And, and the next thing I know, I was unconscious. Now, I don't know how long I was unconscious. I really don't. I have no idea. I, I don't think it was too long. I remember thinking, you're dead. But I was out for a while. When I started, when I started to, I guess when I started to come to, or when I, 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 I was trying to breathe, and and I was, I was sucking in hot ash and debris, and it was burning, it was burning my lungs and my neck, my neck and my throat. And it, it really hurt. It really, it, it really hurt. I was sucking in the hot ash and debris, and, and I thought, "Damn, I'm gonna, I'm, 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 I'm probably gonna die." But I, but I. I, I, I had to have oxygen and I couldn't get it. And I don't know how long that was, I really don't. But, but I, 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 I tried to get air and I couldn't get it. And I wanted to breathe, but, but I didn't want to suck in that hot ash. And, that, 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 and there, were, there, was, there, were, there was flames, those things were red hot. The, the, the stuff I was sucking in. 
and I don't know how long that was. But I was gasping for air, and that 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 was that was probably the the the, the most terrible part of it, you know. And and it was getting down into here too. It was the, it was getting down into here. And finally, I finally I I, I guess I started to get air. And, and and I and I was just, I was just sitting there like I am now. On the ground, and and finally I I started to get air, and I and I just was laying there, and uh, I don't know how long that was. I really don't. But 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 then I realized it was it was pitch black outside. Well, not not pitch black, but but it was dark out. Because every everywhere. When I, I started to be able to see a little bit, and my eyes were full of blood, my, I, I, I had a, I had a wound on top of my head. There's a, there's a, if you look, there's a scar on top of my, my head. Uh, it, it's probably good that I, I bled from my head because it. I bled down into my face and in into my eyes, and, and my eyes were all full of blood, which probably helped my eyes. But I, I laid there for I, I don't know how long, until finally I, I was able to breathe some. And, and my ribs, it felt like somebody beat them in, in with a baseball bat or jumped up and down on them with a pair of boots. And they, they all felt like they were broke at the time. <clears throat> I, I had trouble breathing. I, I was a mess. I was bleeding. I could feel I was bleeding from everywhere. When, when I finally did get my vision back, I, I, I had my sleeves down already because it was it was seven o'clock, mm -hmm. and we, you know, we always used to roll our sleeves down, so we didn't get bit up by mosquitoes. And and when when I had my sleeves down, my I I could I could see a little bit, and my shirt was on fire. Uh, the the bomb blast, it's it's it set both both sleeves were on fire, and and I wanted to put them out, but I couldn't move my arms. I, I couldn't move move any part of my body because I was so stunned from the bomb blast. Uh, it, it, it was, um, you, ever, you ever have a zinger from in, in football or something? Mm -hmm. it, it was like that. It's like you, you, you just couldn't, couldn't move or do anything. It, 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 it's... Total shock to the body. I, I was just sitting there, and I just couldn't move. I was on fire, and I couldn't move. Anyway, I sat there for a while, and I kept waiting for something to happen, you know. And I, I. I kept willing my body to, to, to do something, and like I say, I don't know how how long all this stuff, what the what the time periods were, on 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 this stuff, and it it took a while before I finally was able to move, and I I finally was able to get my arms to move and. and Finally, I was able to put out the fires, and, and then then I finally was able to start to to move some and move my legs. I kept I, I kept saying to myself, "Get up, get up," you know, and and again, the time time. I just couldn't couldn't tell you the time. 
couldn't tell you time periods. I, I, I kept trying to get up. And I must have fell down a dozen or more times. I, I, I get, get part way up. It, it was worse at the beginning. I'd get this far up and I'd fall down. And then I'd get this far up and I'd fall down. I'd get this far up and I'd fall down. Get this far, and I. But I kept trying, you know. And finally, I got to my feet, and I was standing there, and I'm wobbling, and and I'm looking around, and everywhere I looked, everything was on fire. Bodies were on fire, and equipment was on. Rucksacks were on fire, and everything was on fire. And I thought. Hell, they can see us. Now, if you'd asked me who they were, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. If you'd asked me where I was or what was going on, I might not have been able to tell you. All I knew is we were in a bad situation, and who we were, I don't. I, I couldn't tell you the whole situation. If you'd asked me, I, I don't know if I could have told you. We heard or we, there were there was a group of North Vietnamese right out right at the top of the perimeter, a, a, a bunch of them that were killed too mm -hmm. from the bomb. So I don't know. So it was just misplaced that bomb. It just Oh, he shouldn't have dropped it. Yeah. 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 He shouldn't have even been there. Yeah. He the the Air Force was. Fl Come here, I'll show you a map. Okay, where are we here? Okay, we're here. The Air Force, the Air Force was flying across the top here, east to west. See here, east, west, east to west. They were flying across here. This this marine come this way. He was he was flying. He was flying here. Maybe 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 like right here. That marine was flying this way. Now he shouldn't have been there. And he dropped. He dropped. He dropped down in here. And let's say our top of our perimeter was like right like this. You know, let's say we were like this. He took out our CP, which was like right here. How far was it from here to here, the top? Oh, a couple hundred yards, maybe. The air, see, they were this. The air force was no threat. They were yeah. they were a couple hundred yards away. Mm -hmm. They were doing a great job, you know. They were they were they were bombing the shit out of them, but they weren't close enough to do us any any hurt. But this marine, he shouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. you, you don't overfly troops. Mm -hmm. And in in anyway, this guy here, he overflew us, and uh, or he he was close enough to drop a bomb that would have hurt us, and he overflew us like that. But I knew we were backlit. Something says, you're backlit, you need to get those fires out. So I started, I was the first one that started yelling on that hill. I, stu I stood up, or when I stood up, I started, I saw the, that we were backlit. They could see in into our perimeter, but we couldn't see out. Right. And I started yelling, Put out the fires, they can see us. Put out the fires, they can see in, they can see us. Put out the fires, we're backlit. And then slowly but surely the fires went out. Guys started putting out the fires. So apparently what I said had an effect. But I, I was the first one that started yelling, put out the fires. And, and and 
then I got down on my hands and knees and I started going around where I was and, and started helping people in, in patch. I, 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 my, my friend Sanchez, the guy that was right here, the guy that was here, he, he was, he was Tinney's F.O. He was Randy Tinney's F.O. Now Tinney was right here when the bomb came. It picked him up and threw him about 15 feet, but I didn't find him right away. Sanchez, I think what happened to him was, I think the, the, the bomb hit a tree and the, the branch that the tree hit, uh, or the bomb hit, uh, come down and come across his torso. He, he was laying pinned down a, across his torso with, the, with a branch of a tree and that, and that tree was about this big around, or that branch was about this big around, about 20 feet long. Now I tried to pick it up, it, it was that ironwood, mm -hmm. remember the ironwood? Yep. That you, you hit with a yep, the, yep. hit with a, a machete and it would bounce off like it was iron. Yeah, really dense tree. Yeah, really dense tree. That's what was on top of them. And I tried to pick it up and I couldn't move it. And 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 he was frantic. He was screaming, get this off of me, get this off of me. Now, if this thing landed on him, it crushed him. It, it was right across his torso. I realized, as, 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 as he's screaming at me, I realized we're in virgin jungle. So I got down on my hands and knees and, and I dug out the dirt underneath them. And I made a hole for him to fall into. Now the problem was that that thing was keeping the pressure on him right. to keep him from bleeding. When I pulled him out, it released it, and and then he bled out. So he, but but at least he wasn't frantic about being pinned. So I gave him what he wanted, but it killed him. And 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 that bothers me. Well, there was nothing you could do. You, I know. You, you did I, everything you could. I know. But it, but it, by but but by but by giving him what he he wanted, I killed him. You tried everything you possibly could. I know. I, I, I knew he would die, but but what can you do? He wanted out from under that tree. Well, he would have died either way. I know. I know that. He was from Anaheim, California. His name was Jesse Sanchez. Believe me, every every November I go through this. So what happened next? Well, then I I the, the guy that was laying right here was was had been wounded earlier in the day. His name was Cunningham. He uh he had been machine gunned. He was the he was the D Company's attachment. He was an en engineer. He, he his job was to blow up tunnels and blow things, trees, whatever we wanted blown up. He was en an engineer, but he got machine gunned. Tinney was given sitting on the other side of him. He was giving him an IV. Uh, Tenny was an F.O. Mm -hmm. um, when the bomb came in, it tore two legs off Cunningham. 
in one arm. He left him where he was, but he did the two legs in one arm. Uh, Tenny it tore off his calf muscle and it threw him about 15 feet back that way. Uh, Cunningham grabbed me by, by my ankle and said, Medic, Medic, help me. I says, look, I'm not a medic, but let me go so I can get some bandages. Now, I knew there was nothing I could do for him. He was two legs and one arm, right. machine gunned. I mean, I, I, no way in the world. I mean, he, he, could have been, he could have been laying on the table at Presbyterian, and they weren't going to save him, you know. I mean, I... I mean, it does, does face to act, you know. Uh, he, 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 was, he was bad. I mean, real bad. And I said to him, let go of my ankle. He had, he had me by the ankle right here. He wouldn't let go. Would not let go. I said, come on, let, me, let go of me so I can get some bandages. Wouldn't let go. I read. I read. I had to reach down with both of my hands, and it took all my strength to pry his one hand off my. Now he's got one hand. He's missing an arm and two legs. He's got one hand on my ankle. It took all my strength to get his hand off my ankle. He scared me half to death because I didn't think I was going to get that hand off of her. So then I went, I was, I was moving around, I, I found Tenny, uh, I put Tenny in a hole. I moved around a tree. I found Harry Schmidt. I put a bandage on him, but I think he died. I think he bled out. I found Dennis Barbado. Dennis Barbado is still alive. He he was a medic. He was in A Company. I knew he, me and him were. I was the platoon RTO, and Dennis was the platoon medic. Uh, he's a, he's a he works in the medical department at uh, Philadelphia Naval Yard now, unless he retired since last time I saw him, talked to him. Uh, anyway, I moved around a tree and I wrapped bandages on a few people. Went back, spent the night with Tenny. That was a mess. I had, I had, you see, scars and some burns on these, these arms. So you make it through the night. No food, no water. Well, I think I think the next day I had maybe a mouthful of water. No food. Oh, I had a can of pears. Did have a can of pears. And that's all I had until Wednesday evening. But from sun that happened Sunday morning I got wounded in the butt. Sunday evening is when they dropped the bomb on us. Monday the the, the water and the pears. Tuesday nothing. 
Wednesday nothing. And I got out Wednesday evening. I, I looked at I looked at my butt Wednesday afternoon and I, well I had gangrene on Monday. Wednesday I, I looked at the gangrene again and I went, this is gonna kill me. So I went down to the dust off pad and I showed Major Kelly who was running the dust off pad the the wound and he says get on the next chopper. So I got on the next chopper and it was taking rounds as as as, uh, as it was pulling out. And I got off the chopper at Docteau and some big big six foot two maybe colonel come walking towards me and it wasn't what he said it's the way he said it and I told him what to do to himself and he turned around and went the other way and next morning Thanksgiving morning 1967 I was on the table and I was the turkey being carved where did they take you to? Quinion. I don't know, it's at 97th and back? Yeah. It's right on the South China Sea. 97th? Yeah. And back? I was there for two days. They had NVA in our ward. There were a whole bunch of Hill 875 guys in the ward, and they kept telling the MPs, take a walk. And, and the MPs were scared to death. They said, no, we can't do that. And they were afraid we were going to, that they were going to. Well, you just spent all that time trying to kill the NVA and they yeah. were trying to kill you. Oh, the, 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 the officers kept their mouth shut, but the enlisted guy kept running his mouth. They, they were afraid that the MBA were going to get killed, which they probably would have. You know, the guys that could get out of bed, I couldn't. I was, I had my, my butt all chopped off at the time. I couldn't walk. But uh, they, the, the guys that could walk kept telling the MPs, take a walk. You know, MPs were afraid. <laughs> they said, you kill these guys, we ha we're going to jail. Yeah. They, any, anyway, they stuck me on a plane. They flew me to the Philippines. And then I was in the Air Force Hospital there for a couple of days. And then they stuck me on a plane and flew me to Yokohama, Japan. And I was in the 106th General Hospital. Until the end of January. And I got back to Vietnam two days before the Tet Offensive. They were real nice. They made sure I got back for the fun and games. And I almost got killed in the Tet Offensive because they sent me down to play coup the night before the Tet Offensive started. And the Tet Offensive started while I was down there and uh, almost got killed roaming around down there. And Walter Cronkite said we were getting our ass kicked during the Tet Offensive, and I don't know where he was, but all the bodies I saw were Victor Charlie and NVA. Uh, I don't know what he was seeing, but all the everything I saw said we were winning, that we were kicking the living shit out of them. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, he lied. I don't know what he was saying. Yeah, 
I, I got some stories, boy. So how long did you stay once you went back to uh, play coup? How and long I, did you stay well, in I, I stayed at, I, 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 I was only there for, at play coup for just one, two days. And then I went back to my unit up at Camp Inari, which was the 4th Infantry Division's base camp. And uh, then I rejoined my unit. And we, we ended up moving across country until we hit a place called Camp, or LZ English. And then the, the 2nd Battalion, 503rd Infantry, which is the 2nd Battalion of the 173rd, uh, operated out of LZ English until I left, and, and, and even beyond that. Uh, but, but I left out of LZ English and went home, and uh, I only had one, one more thing before, uh, right, uh, a couple days before I left, I had to go down to Company B Medical, which was the 173rd's medical uh, detachment, mm -hmm. and identify bodies uh, from my company that were killed in an ambush. And, you know, they have to screw things up right before you go home. You know, leave you leave you with an aftertaste. Uh, and a couple, couple friends of mine killed in that ambush. And uh, one of them was going home a week after me. You know, I was going home in, in, about, in about a week and a half. And then he was going home a week, a week later. And his name was Porfir Porfirio Sam Solano. Good kid, too. So when you came home, what kind of reaction did you have? Because no, you've been thought, through a lot. I thought, that, uh, I thought that we were treated, for the most part, like lepers. That the, that the people thought, uh, you know, we, that, that we were we were at fault for the war. That it was our fault, you know. And we didn't get any support from the World War II guys, none whatsoever. And the funny part is, <laughs> they were the ones running it. They were the ones responsible for it. They were the congressmen. They were the senators. They were the president. They were the they were the senior they were the generals they were the senior NCOs, we were just the just the the the, the, the kids were fighting it, and yet we were and yet we were the ones responsible for it. Explain that to me. Can you explain that to me? There is no explaining it. We were responsible for that war. We just did. We just did what we were told. Now you had told me in the initial, when the 500 pound bomb, hmm? I said you had told me earlier when the 500 pound bomb exploded. Father Waters was right close to you. Yeah. He was. He was about where you are. And when you came to. Mm -hmm. Oh, he was, he was gone. He was, he was blown away. He, he was, we, I don't know if I should tell this part because, you know, it's, it, it, that's, that's your call. No, I'm not going to do it. Okay. I mean, you, you heard what I said. I mean, Did you ever uh, follow up to, uh, you said you had talked to one of the families. Did you try talking to families when you came back? No, no. I mean, I, 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 I talked to, Lieutenant Boonsell and his family. He was about oh, 30 feet down the hill, 20, 30 feet down the hill. He was an FO for, he was a 319th artillery guy like uh, Sergeant Tenney, uh, like like Sanchez. Uh, Lieutenant Boonsell was a A Company's FO. I talked to his brother. I told him about his brother. You know, he said, he he asked me about his brother. I says, I says, I says, I, I I says, I think you can assure yourself that he was killed instantly. 
I said, he was killed by the bomb. And I says, I, he was in the open. And I says, I think you can assure yourself that he was killed instantly. And, and I, I says, I, I truly believe that. You know? I says, anybody uh, uh, that, that, that I know that that happened to, uh, yeah, he, he was probably killed instantly. And today you suffer from some of the wounds still yeah. give you a, a lot of problems. Yeah, I'll show you this one, but... Yeah. No, no, I don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> but you still have issues oh, sure. uh, as I, a result. I, yeah, I'm 100% VA rated disabled. Okay. And we had talked a little bit, too, about PTSD and mm -hmm. uh, the struggle with that. I, uh, I have trouble sleeping. Uh, the, bomb, the bomb happened right at the edge of dark. And, and when, I, when I came to, it was pitch black, well, except for the fires. Right. And, and it, it's, 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 it's hard, it's hard to explain it to somebody who has no concept of this, this, This is hard to 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 explain. Um, it, it, it's very hard to explain. You were uh, included in several different books. How did they get in contact with you? I I read Valor in Vietnam. Um, by Alan Clark. Mm -hmm. Can I get the book? No, I, we'll, we'll get it. Uh, I, I read Alan B. Clark's Valor and, well, I, I read his first book and and he was, he lost both his legs at the knee and uh, I, I, I wrote him a thing to, to talk about his first book, mm -hmm. and uh, I told him I was telling him this story, and uh, he asked me if if he could put that story in his second book, and so that's how I ended up in this book. It's a hell of a book. Alan Alan was a special forces officer at Docto. Uh, he, he lost both his legs at the knee five days before Alpha Company had its June 22nd battle where they lost 76 people. So five days before Alpha Company, Alan Clark lost both his knees, her legs at the knee. Uh, he he was he's a former assistant secretary of the VA in two administrations. He's a former assistant or former director of the U.S. military cemetery system, uh, and he's he was also Ross Perot's personal financial advisor. Uh, now this one, uh, this one is written by one of my former executive officers, uh, a Delta Company executive officer and uh, a Charlie Company commander. And he, I, he might have even been Delta Company's company commander at one time too. Uh, he's a retired Fulberg Colonel, uh, Special Forces. Now this book is a written as a novel but it's a true story based uh, and, and it, it it means grunt, 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 grunt in four different armies. Uh, uh, Captain Prisk, Colonel Prisk, his father was a, 
was the liaison he was the liaison officer between British Lord Montgomery and and General Eisenhower during World War II. Wow. Yeah. Um, but all the names have been changed in this book um, to <laughs> to protect the innocent. <laughs> Uh, my name in this book is is not Fleming, it's Deming. Deming. Uh, so if you see Sergeant Deming in here, I'm, I'm, I'm Sergeant Deming. Oh, here I am in the hospital. Oh, wait, no, that's him. That's, this is Gary Prisk. I thought that was, I thought that it was a hospital picture of mine. Yeah. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to cover? Oh. I have two questions. So how many how many men were killed when the bomb went off? That's a good question. Um, they, they say 50 and they 50 killed, 50 wounded. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I couldn't tell you, but I'll tell you one thing. Uh, the Army numbers, total BS. Uh, that the, the, the Army numbers are wrong. They, they have, if you look at their, their list of, of, of killed and wounded, uh, they, have people, they have people KIA on the 21st or the 22nd. Uh, wait. That, that were killed on the 19th. Uh, I know when I know when some of these people were killed, and that that list is totally wrong, totally wrong. And after the bomb went off, there was still a battle going on. Right? Oh, the battle the battle went from the 19th, 19, 20, 21, 22, probably till the 23rd. And what day did the bomb go off? 19. There were still four or five more days. Oh, they were, they were, we were, we were mortared the whole time. So whenever you finally got your bearings after the bomb went off, you still had to, you still had the battle. There was no, oh, it, there, it, you it, were taking it, This break. thing was not ongoing. Mm -hmm. This thing, this thing went from, they, they mortared us all day, you know, it, Hill 875 was totally, uh, all, all the artillery, all of the, uh, all, of, all of the artillery and mortars and everything was, was all pre-registered. They had FOs in, in all the hills surrounding uh, 875 and they could, they could call, call in uh, art, artillery or mortars. On, on, on whatever the spot they wanted, they had it all pre-registered. They knew they knew, they could call wherever they wanted. I mean, they had it pre-registered, if you understand it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and another thing. They had it all dialed in. Yeah, they had it all dialed in. Another thing was, uh, our artillery, for the most part, we were on the we were on the gun target. Mostly, only artillery people or infantry people understand this. We were on the gun target line of our 105s, our 155s, and our four deuce. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and when you're on hills like this, and you have 300 foot trees, that doesn't work. Yeah, the math. You, you know can. That, that, right. that 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 geometry just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, that you're you're screwed. Yeah. I don't. I, you know, you you guys are an infantry, but that that just now when they say lob, it's still on a trajectory. It's not like a mortar. Well, you, you know, so it, it makes a difference. You know, you're here, and the, and the enemy's here, and you have trees like this, right? And your and your artillery's coming this way. Yeah, it's going to hit the trees. Does it work? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. A mortar a mortar goes up and comes down. Where you know, artillery, they, they, you know, it's 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 this, right? 
So you were just in deep shit for the whole time. Exactly. How many men walked off that hill? How many men survived? Oh, I don't know. Well, you mean in one piece? I don't know. But I can tell you, I have one guy, and I'm not going to name. His, I'm not going to say his name. He's he's a real good personal friend of mine. He he suffers from uh, survivor guilt because he wasn't wounded at all. And and I told him, I says, hey, look. I'm thrilled to death that you that nothing happened to you. I'm a, I'm a, I'm ecstatic. And I says, believe me, I'm, I'm glad you weren't wounded. And I says, and I'm sure everybody else is. I'm we're, I'm glad somebody wasn't wounded. I says, hey, so so I got wounded. Big deal, you know. I says that you know. I'm glad you weren't. I says. Be happy you weren't wounded. He, but he's he's all upset that everybody else got wounded and he wasn't. Survivor. He, he's he, he's he he is he's he's really messed up over. It. Survival guilt is something yeah. that m most vets that were involved in combat that didn't get injured or not as seriously injured, oftentimes even if they were injured and didn't die, still they suffer from. Oh, I know. I know. And it's, it's, oh, believe me, I. I know. I know. And, and I and I've talked to him, and and I and I told him, I says, please, get over it. I says, okay, I was wounded. The other guys were wounded. Okay, they some guys were killed. I says, believe me, those guys, if they could say something, would say, we're glad you weren't were weren't wounded. I'm sure they would. Exactly. You know? So, so, you know, please don't feel this way. But he but he doesn't. I can't talk him out of it. And I've done my best. I mean I, I talk I've talked to him several times. He lives in another state, you know, and every time I talk to him I says, please, don't feel this way. I, I says, you know, I, I say I'll take it for you, you know? Don't don't feel this way. Do you find that being involved in organizations now like Vietnam Veterans and the VBC, well, I mean, I, I do you get, find that helpful? I get to talk it out, you know, so, you know? I mean, you, you, you this, this isn't easy, you know? I mean, imagine if I, I, I had to keep this all bottled up. Exactly. That's why we have the brotherhood we have. I mean, in 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 in, in I, and I've probably forgotten some that, you know, you aren't even catching. You don't even catch it all. You know, every every November, on the nineteenth, I go through it. Starting the 19th, I, I, I go through it, probably even the 18th. I, I know exactly where I am every minute, you know? I mean, I picture myself where, where I was, doing what I was. I could taste it. I could smell it. For years, the, the smoke. Smoke drove me crazy. Still does. If especially a certain smell of smoke uh, drove me crazy. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, look, take a look at some of my books, and you'll see. Well, thanks for doing this. Um, I think it's gonna. It's it's good that we have your story preserved. Uh, others can listen to it and understand because it's 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 not easy, as you said. It's uh, 
uh, it was just a tough time. And we really appreciate you sharing it with everybody. Welcome home, brother.